All right, welcome. Um, this is the the first part in a little mini three part series on series on real time signal processing, and kind of as it applies to the guitar for the Monkey Jam, but um, it doesn't necessarily need to be just for the guitar. Um, some of the concepts here apply elsewhere. Um, it's just the guitar is a really fun, a really fun exercise. So um, you see on my uh, screen here, uh, we have a guitar and you know, this is a picture of like a carbon bolt T and we have a cable going into a nice Marshall amplifier. Um, there we go, Fender or Vox. And so what we're trying to do digitally is kind of uh, get some of the cool tones that you would out of this Marshall or Fender or Vox um, into our Monkey Jam software. Now, we're not going to be spending a lot of time doing direct modeling, meaning we're trying to get every nuance, um, but should kind of show you how it's done um, and give you the building blocks that um, would be really cool if maybe you're going to come up with something new. Uh, you know, Line 6, you know, and uh, PV and everyone, they, they kind of make stuff to do modeling. And kind of one of the things they do, which, you know, it's a little unfortunate, their whole focus is on modeling what already exists. Like, what about, let's make something new that does, you know, maybe doesn't exist. Now, it's kind of cool to make things we want to sound like the Fender Twin Reverb or you know, Vox um, amplifier, but you know what? It's time to move on. Um, they've been done. Uh, maybe you'll have tools that you'll come up with a new, totally new sound that no one else has. So um, so here we go. So we're going to make a little mini version of the Line 6 Pod. Is it a full product? No, but you're going to see what kind of goes into it. Um, and you have kind of a low-cost platform for playing around, which, which is kind of neat. Um, so conceptually, the hardware to do this is simple. So we need a couple different pieces. So we have kind of our analog signal coming from the guitar. So we have pickups, which we'll talk about in another video of the physics, that kind of generate a waveform that's related to the string, you know, the motion of the string. We need an analog digital converter that gives us numerical codes that kind of gives us the different sample points, you know, on this waveform. We need some black box in the middle here, in this case a blue box, uh, that does processing that generates new codes for our process tone. Then we need a D to A converter, you know, to get our signal back. And if we do it right, um, we should be able to make, you know, change your guitar sound to make it sound like it's coming from maybe a different amp or play with the tone controls or, or do something really wacky. Um, so the question is, you know, how do you do that? How do you get it to sound like a Fender Twin Reverb? Now, Line 6, uh, you know, PV, um, you know, all these companies have spent a lot of money kind of di dissecting like every piece and part to one model 100%. So, um, while that sounds really complex, the way you go about it isn't isn't all that difficult. And it turns out you don't need a ton of processing to really modify the sound of the guitar and get really good tones. Now, I liken it to like a cover band. Like you can go listen to a cover band that'll cover a song. There are some cover bands that their whole goal is to sound exactly like the original artist. And they will spend, you know, um, a long time doing it and sound really good. But some of the best cover bands will cover songs, but they put their own twist on it. They get a new sound that no one else has done, and sometimes sounds even better. My favorite example is uh, the song Voodoo Child by uh, you know Stevie, or I'm sorry, uh, Jimi Hendrix did a version. But my, my opinion is that the whole reason uh, Jimi Hendrix did a version is so that Stevie Ray Vaughan can come by and do a better version because I think his is better. He didn't worry about, he got the, uh, the inspiration, you know, he got like the overall kind of blueprint for the song, but he had his own, uh, kind of touch to it. And maybe that's what you're going to do is you'll kind of come up with a sound that's just you. You'll get something maybe close to a Fender Twin, but is, if it's perfect, who cares? You, maybe you get something better. So, I want to talk about how do you do this? How do, you know, some techniques in real-time signal processing. So in this first video, I just want to get some very high-level concepts across um, so we can kind of move on and, and do fancier stuff. All right, so what I'm going to draw here is um, some data points. And let's say we were to have a waveform, and I'll draw this blue one. 
and we're kind of zoomed in here. I'll just draw it like this. And the blue is our analog waveform. The red are the points we sampled with our A to D converter. And we'll assume the A to D converter is sufficient resolution to pick up these changes. And then, you know, we have an appropriate sample rate, meaning how quickly from one sample to the next, uh, you know, that we can pick up all of the changes. Um, in the physics of the guitar video, I'm going to discuss, you know, how do we pick that. Um, but for now, let's just assume we have it. So there are two kind of approaches to what we're going to call, you know, real-time signal processing. Meaning in real time, when someone plucks the string, they better hear a result instantly. It can't be like we're recording to a WAV file, and then we start over, and then we process it and play it back. One is going to call, be called, I'm going to call sample-based. The other way, we're going to call this block-based. Or another way to say it is sample by sample or block by block. Now, the first example in sample by sample processing, and I'll pick this one to start, is we read this value. We have the delta T time to do a computation and produce a result. And I'll draw it in green here. And so when we get to, for example, this point, we have one more time period to generate a result, so on and so forth. And I'll just draw a couple more here. So every time, like I said, we get a sample, we have to produce an output. And so we have delta T for sample by sample uh, processing. So in this case, this sample would have driven this output, this sample would have driven this output, you know, this sample would have driven that output. And then kind of when we're all done, we have our new waveform that's generated. And for sample by sample, the delay through our processing routine is just delta T. It's our sample time. Now, what's nice about that is that that is the absolute best we can get in any digital system, period. You know, there is, you can't get any better. Better. We have a latency. We call that latency is the time from the input makes the output of one sample. Now, what that means for your hardware, you have to have tuned hardware that can quickly grab the data, process it, and send it back out. And that can be somewhat demanding. Now, in block-based, to get real-time is you sample, say, and we'll pick five, you know, for a number. We wait until we get five samples, all right? And I'm just going to draw, like, another one over the next five. All right, and I'll call this block one. This is block two. It goes on further in time. We wait till we get five samples. And then at that point, once we get all five samples, we can generate, we can do the computation to have the next five outputs. So, and we can do them all at once. So, like, let me draw the green. And let's say it looks something like this. Let me draw a line through it. All right. And so these five samples here, one, two, three, four, five, are driving samples output in the next block. All right. And what that, what that translates to are the, the other samples. Let me grab green here. they will be over here in the next block. 
Now, how is this different? The difference is, is how long we wait before we do our computation. So in sample by sample processing, it's literally every time we get a sample, we have one period to output. Block by block, we choose a block size and then output. So the delay in this case, you know, is delta T, you know, times N, the number of samples. Um, let me do this. Let me go get my eraser here. Let me erase that. We'll say delta T times, you know, block size. So the key is you have to pick a block size small enough that the user won't notice that there's a problem that there is a delay in the samples. Now this is tricky because if it's too long, you have too much latency and you, you can definitely hear it. And when someone is playing and expecting a real time result from their own ears, uh, once you get above a few milliseconds, you can notice it. And the problem with block processing is that let's say you do pick a small enough block, that's well and good. But if you have other things in your signal processing chain down the line, meaning something out of your system that's also doing block processing, you have to add him up in the eight latency as well. So all those things can add up to be significant. Now, why would you want to do block processing? You know, what's the advantage to this? Well, here's the advantage. Is some hardware and some microprocessing systems uh, a PC is a good example. A PC, even though you might have like a 3 gigahertz PC, cannot do sample by sample processing. There's so much overhead every time a new sample comes in, it's more efficient to grab data, store it in a block, pass that block along to another process to then process it one time and send it back out. That if the overhead is great enough, it makes more sense to only have that overhead on every block, not on every sample. Conversely, with sample-based processing on every point, um, your latency is next to nothing, but it requires more, uh, if you have a lot of overhead in grabbing the data, um, you spend CPU time in that. Now here is, here's the advantage for the monkey jam. Our DSP processor, because it's literally just there to do DSP, uh, we have very little latency and um, or overhead in grabbing a sample. It's literally samples go in a little mini queue um, from the I squared S interface, and then we get an interrupt, we read it, process it, and dump it back out. So there's not a lot of action. So we don't, or I uh, say, there's not a lot of things to do. Um, if we're on a PC, that's definitely it. Doesn't have that same capability. Uh, it has to do block by block. Um, now, there's some algorithms that you may encounter that require a whole block of data. Uh, but in for a lot of what we're going to do, that's not the case. Now, now that we have this concept of block versus uh, sample based, all of the Monkey Jam software is sample by sample. Now, the trick is some of the software, the filtering algorithms, were written... Um, kind of by hand, because, for example, the ARM Simsys DSP libraries, which we discussed before um, in the video regarding the data types, the Q31 data types, they're based on block processing. Now, it's really not that hard to move between the two. It's just, do you process one or multiple samples at a time? Now, last, the last kind of piece here I want to introduce you to is some nomenclature um, for real-time processing, because when you're processing in real time, the only thing that you and your code can ever know about is the current sample. And we always call that, we'll call it X subscript N. It's very common in what's called a difference equation to refer to the signal as X sub N. You can't possibly know the future because it hasn't happened yet. Now, if you had something like a wave file, where at any point in time you can look in the future, that's different. But real time's tricky because the only thing you know is our current sample in a time history of it. Now, the way we refer to these previous samples is we say x of n minus 1 
This is x sub n minus 2. So it kind of looks like an array, but it's, it's not necessarily an array. n minus 3, n minus 4. So in code, whenever you look at this nomenclature, what x of n means is your current sample that you've just recorded. Now, we have another variable we use called y of n. That's our current output, you know. Output. And then we can have a previous output. Maybe we want to keep track of previous outputs, which we're going to see an IR filter in course in, or I'm sorry, flange effects need that. And we'll say current input. So uh, knowing that, it turns that all signal processing algorithms, especially from the filtering, you come up with a difference equation that kind of looks like this. You write it y of n equals x of n, and we can say plus maybe some variable alpha, x of n minus 2, so on and so forth, um, where we always write, we always write um, our algorithm in terms of our current output is equal to some sum of the time history of previous uh, samples. Now, we can also include in the sum previous outputs. That's a possibility, too. Now, what I just wrote down here is the concept of this is an IAR filter. Um, turns out we can make any tone control we want from this structure. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about it anymore for now, but I just want you to get used to this is in real-time signal processing what we need to be concerned of. We can have our current output, and the only thing we have to work with, you know, is a current input or some time history. And the limitation is the amount of memory in our CPU, in our microcontroller, DSP, controls how far back we can go. Now, it turns out for some effects like uh, reverb or serious delay, you need a long time history. But for filtering, you don't. You only need a few samples, um, a handful of samples. So, um, so there you go. That's uh, your first introduction to real-time signal processing. Um, in the next video, we're going to look at tone control. You know, how do we do tone control? Um, and then after that, we're going to look at, you know, how do we do nonlinear uh, non stuff? Meaning, uh, you know, how do we simulate, in particular, a tube? And that'll be really cool to look at. Um, so tune in for the next video.